incognito. Hi guys. As we're filing in, you guys want to hear a joke? No. Yeah. Yeah. That's a mixed response, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Yes. Tell it. Please. Go. I have good jokes. Go uh, how many How many Catholics does it take to screw in a light bulb? Yes. None. We use candles. Okay, I this one. What do you call a blind nun? A Roman Catholic! Oh. Get it? Because she's blind. <laughs> it's bad if you have to explain, Jamie. <laughs> Does anybody have any good jokes? Why can't Anglicans play chess? They can't tell the difference between the bishop and the queen. <laughs> Doesn't matter, he's not coming. <laughs> Ouch. We have to get going. If I have to tell all your jokes, I have to keep. We'll tell them later. Keep it in mind, we'll tell them later. We gotta get rolling. Mr. Jamie, do you wanna introduce what we're doing next? Yes, yes, yes. Alright, how's everybody doing right now? All right, so up next, I want to give a very warm welcome to our very own Dr. Sek. He is the president here at Carroll College. Uh, so he joined us on June 1st in 2018. Um, and so he is a lifelong Roman Catholic, and he's deeply committed to the church. Um, he actually served as the president of St. Patrick's Co-Cathedral Parish in Billings. Um, so he's a very faithful man, and we'd love to have him here. And so please give Dr. Sek a warm welcome. Thanks, Jamie. Good morning. Good morning. Jamie, I think they can do better than that. So let me let me let me uh, rephrase the question. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> are you guys having a wonderful weekend? All right, all right. You're now, uh, Jamie. Are they all from Montana? No. No. Oh, most of them. Huh? Washington. Okay, let's let's do this a state by uh, state. We'll we'll do Montana last. So, um, how far out do you go geographically? Okay, if you're from Washington, stand up and just stay standing. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. Oregon, please stand. All right. The great state of Idaho, please stand. We need to work on, do we have Idaho here? We need to work on Idaho. Brazil. All right. Okay. I happen to be 50% German and 50% Italian. So if you're from Germany and Italy, stand. All right, let's give them a round of applause. That's fantastic. Wyoming, anyone from Wyoming? All right. 
North or South Dakota? Okay, now, here's the big one. Montana, Stan. Okay, now we're gonna subdivide this a little bit. Have a seat, have a seat. If you are from the Great Falls Billings Diocese, please stand. All right, look at that. Let's go for Great Falls Billings. And now you can have a seat and the Helena Diocese. All right, that's fantastic. Wonderful. Well, I've, I've been looking forward to this uh, all weekend and, and uh, I've, it's truly an honor and pleasure for me to have the privilege and opportunity to be the 18th president of Carroll College. And I would like to welcome you to your college. Yes, your college, because Carroll College is a diocesan college serving the people of the Helena Diocese, but really we carry that further to think of ourselves as a diocesan college serving both dioceses, the Helena Diocese and the Great Falls Billings Diocese. And I love your theme, ignite on fire, but not consumed. And I've, and I've thought a lot about that over the weekend. And it causes me to reflect on uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke 1249, and I'll read it. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and however I wish it were already kindled. Think about that. Each of you are on fire for our diocese and for our church. You represent the future of our church and our passion and dedication for the words and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to say to you this morning that I believe Carroll College is part of the fire, spreading the gospel and word of Jesus to Montana and beyond, and you, my friends, are a part of that. We are celebrating our 110th anniversary uh, of existence here at Carroll College. Think about that, 110 years. Let's give Carroll a round of applause for his birthday. And I wanna, I wanna share with you briefly a story about the creation of Carroll College that I think is, is truly special and I enjoy telling it. You were at the, the you, you attended mass at the Cathedral of St. Helena last night, right? All right. It's, it's a magnificent cathedral. In fact, it's probably, I think, one of the most magnificent cathedrals uh, in the United States. And, and it's right here in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. And I'd just like to tell you a bit about how it was formed and, and how it was created. The first bishop in Montana was Bishop Brondell. And he had a vision to create a cathedral in the Rocky Mountains. And so he, Helena back in those days, the late 19th century, was very prosperous. Why was Helena prosperous back in those days? What were they mining here? Gold. So there was a lot of money in this town. And so Bishop Rondell raised a lot of money to build his cathedral. Unfortunately, he would never see the cathedral. He died. And, and uh, Bishop John Patrick Carroll was selected by the Pope to replace him. And so Bishop Carroll came out here from Wisconsin. He continued the fundraising effort for the cathedral and he raised a lot of money. However, he wanted something else other than a grand cathedral. He wanted to found the first Catholic college in Montana. And so he did something that was very brave. He carved out a third of the money that he had raised and Bishop Rondell had raised to build the Cathedral of St. Helena to buy the 65 acres that this college sits on today and, and to build St. Charles Hall, which is on top of the hill, which is still the largest building on campus. So when you walk into the magnificent the Cathedral of St. Helena, it could have been one-third larger than it is today. Think about that. Something else that's really interesting is St. Charles Hall is built on top of a hill. It's affectionately known as the Rock. 
And as you may have noticed last night, the Cathedral of St. Helena is built on a hill. And so Bishop John Patrick Carroll thought of one hill as faith and the other hill as reason, faith and reason. And so Carroll College, after it was formed, was, was originally called Mount St. Charles College. And that was to honor St. Charles Borromeo, who put forth the idea of establishing Catholic colleges that were to be sponsored by Catholic dioceses at the Council of Trent. And in 1932, the Bishop of Helena at that time, Bishop Finnegan, would proclaim the name of the college be changed to Carroll College in honor of John Patrick Carroll, who had just recently passed away. Now I'd like to share with you a few thoughts about Carroll and our Catholic mission. And that's something that's very important to me as its 18th president. Our students live and practice their Catholic faith here, and, I, I, and many of you know that because you're already involved with the college. Those who answer his call seek to receive his love and then give it away with passion and purpose. And that happens here at Carroll. And here are a few examples that I'd just like to highlight. Raise your hands if you've been to one of our Sunday night, regular 8 p.m. Sunday night masses at Carroll. Raise your hands. There's a few of you <clears throat> in the new All Saints Chapel. It's full. There are 350 to 400 uh, students there every Sunday night at 8 o'clock. And it is one of the most enriching, holy, spiritual experiences that I've ever had. And we offer Mass every day on this campus, either on this campus or at our cathedral church. And something new this year, we offer adoration of the Blessed Sacrament every day from 10, or excuse me, noon to 10 p.m. every day on this campus. And on Thursday nights, we offer adoration throughout the night to Friday morning, except for this past week when uh, Carol students covered all hours from Friday night to Saturday morning to pray for all of you, which I thought was very special. We also provide our students with the opportunity to participate in Latin Mass two Sundays a month in the afternoon, and confessions are available Wednesdays here and th Saturdays at the cathedral. Our students live their faith through service. This past spring, just a few, uh, few weeks ago, our Headlights program had groups travel to Chicago, East LA, and Denver over spring break. They worked with the Franciscans of the Eucharist in Chicago, the Dolores Mission in East LA, and Christ in the City Ministry in Denver. And, and it was just incredible to talk with them and learn about what they did during those mission trips. Father Mark's homilies are now going out every week via podcast. Raise your hands if you've ever heard one of Father Mark's podcast homilies. I will see if uh, Jamie can arrange for me to get your emails, and I'll send you a link to Father Mark's uh, homilies. They are incredible. Father Mark is, uh, is not with us today. He's down in Kansas City with our men's basketball team, and in case you didn't hear, we won last night. And so Carroll, uh, Carroll College men's basketball team um, are now in uh, the top four, and uh, we will play Lewis Clark uh, State College on Monday night. And uh, only one other time in our 110 year history have we been in the top four in the national basketball. So this is really, really big. However, Father Mark asked me to tell you that he's been keeping all of you in his prayers so that Jesus might change your lives this weekend. And, and also, I want to I mention to you that we're working very hard to add a new major and minor in Catholic studies here at Carroll College. Why? So the truth of our faith can be better understood so that it can be more vibrantly shared. And we hope to have that approved here in the next few weeks. More than all of this, there is a passion and a peace here at Carroll College that is simply amazing. And one of my favorite experiences from last spring 
was the Mass of the Sacraments right after Easter when 13 students were received into the Catholic Church. Let's give them a round of applause. I would be remiss if I did not provide a shout out for the incredible academic experiences and opportunities we have here at Carroll College. And I just want to share a few of them with you today. Did you know Carroll College was ranked just this year as one of the top 25 Catholic colleges in the nation with a Catholic College of Distinction designation for 2018, 2019? I think that deserves a round of applause. Now, here's a question I'm gonna ask you, and all you have to do is raise your hands. If you know, if you already know that Carroll College has the highest graduation rate, public or private, of any college in five states around Montana, raise your hands. Well, raise your hands now, because you do now. <laughs> um, we are really excited about that. And um, that's something that, that we genuinely own. Um, we also were ranked by US News and World Report as the best regional college in the West now for 12 years in a row. And we also received a US News and World Report designation as the best undergraduate teaching college. So we're excited about that. Raise your hands if any of you are interested in uh, pursuing medical school at some point in your lives. Raise them and keep them high. Okay, here's one that you need to remember. Carroll College has a 15-year average of 85% acceptance into medical school. 85% year, or 85 acceptance into medical school, and we've done that now 15 years in a row. Guess what the national average is? 40, 40%. So we're pretty excited about that. Raise your hands if you're interested in nursing. Okay, here's another one for you. Carroll College nursing program <clears throat> last year had a 100% pass rate in the NCLEX RN exam, first try. The only college in Montana to have a 100% pass rate. I think that's worth a round of applause. How many of you are interested in forensics, speech, and debate? Raise your hands. Okay. Carroll College has won or shared the Northwest Forensics Championship 29 years in a row, including this year. That's worth a round of applause. One of the, one of the things we're very proud of is our, our engagement globally. And, um, um, I have the, the true pleasure and honor of uh, accompanying Father Mark and about uh, 25 students to Rome and Assisi this, uh, this May. And I, I know that's tough duty. Somebody has to do it. Um, that was a joke. Uh, but it's, it's going to be, it, it's, I, I am so looking forward to that. But the, what I want to share with you is Father Mark and I are, are going to uh, remain in Rome for a couple days. And we're gonna have conversations with some uh, religious orders of sisters about a space that Carroll College can use for lodging, for food, and for meetings so that our students could spend up to a semester in the Eternal City and uh, a chance to engage in study at the Vatican and, and, and a whole variety of things there as well as Oh, and in one semester, learn the equivalent of two semesters of Italian. So uh, we will keep you posted on that, but that is really, really cool, and I'm excited about that. Our school's motto is non scole sed vite, not for school, but for life. And as you leave here from this weekend, I want you to know that I pray your hearts are on fire with the love of Jesus, his church, and his people. As St. Paul writes to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God you have received. And I want you to think about that and feed the flame through prayers, sacraments, and service. That fire of God's love will continue to light your path as you return home. 
to your homes, your parishes, and your schools. There is no better time than today to begin thinking about becoming a saint that you are called to be. The world needs you. It still works. <laughs> Think about becoming a saint. The world needs you. Your church needs you. Your diocese needs you. Don't wait for someone else to step forward. And don't settle for anything less than holiness. Be yourself. Be holy. Burn brightly for the Lord and light some fires along your way. And may God bless each of you. And I want to end by asking you to join me and in wishing the Carroll College Fighting Saints in Kansas City the very, very best. And I'm going to ask you to say two words, and I'll give you a hint. One starts with go, and the second one is what? Saints. All right. So, Jamie, you count off. One to three. That was pretty good, but Father Kirby did, uh, I, I think they could show a little more enthusiasm. Uh, so so I, I want, our, I want our, our colleagues in Kansas City to be able to hear you. So Jamie, do it again. And you're going to do a lot this time. Ready? One, two, three. Go I think they heard you. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Um, it's so good to have a, a president that cares about our, our Catholic faith and our Catholic tradition. Um, so I hope, I hope you guys feel that warm welcome here at Carroll College. Um, and just know that if, if you want to grow in your faith somewhere in college, um, Carroll's a great place to do that. Um, the faith community is, is thriving and it's burning bright. Um, and I know you guys, you guys love that. So let's give it up for Dr. Sackler. <laughs> games this weekend. How many of you enjoyed playing games this weekend? I don't see all the hands. Games? 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 Well, we have one more game for you. Do we have... How many of you have ever played the game of uh, Kahoot? Alright, I'm going to invite our Miss Gianna and Gracie up to do our Kahoot thing. Alright. So, we're going to pull out your smartphones. Pull out your smartphones. Shout out to those names. Uh, Little Salad, that's beautiful. Penguins and Yeehaw, I love it. We got, we got a Yeet Yeet. I think I saw Father Kirby on there. It was original. All right, do we still need a few, a few seconds? Okay.
I don't know what goat nibba is, and I don't want to know. <laughs> It's happening, and you guys are all going to lose. This is insane. Only in 107th place. Watch out, guys.
jump back to square. It'd be really sad. Oh, yeah. at the same time just go okay now start on this end ready go I don't know what that was that was weird okay. it kind of sounded like one of those like waterfall sounds that you use when you sleep I have to pee now it's like it's like when you listen to running water and then you're like so, how has, con how has convention been? Good, it's been great. Y'all are just not enthusiastic this morning. How was convention? No, I love convention. This is my third time getting to help out and be here with convention, you guys. And I think for me, one of the greatest things is the ability to change, you know? That chance to have that conversion and to really, like, make changes in your life to take with you at the lodge, we say across the lake, but to take with you back to your parishes and into your real life. Uh, so Jamie and I thought well, we would show you how we've changed over the years. So uh, particularly when we were in high school, I don't know about Jamie, but I know those were definitely my awkward years. Um, but I also look the same, so. So. We had our dumb, so yeah. So, this first picture. Can you keep going? These are the same ones. Okay, so this first one is me. Fresh. I was a middle schooler. I had great style. I really can't tell you why. Oh! Wasn't he cute? And then there's Jamie Cleaving. I think Jamie has changed for the better. And I'm speaking on behalf of both Jamies when I say that. Beautiful. So, we have another birthday in the house today. So, we had Sean's birthday, but we also have uh, Sister Christina Marie. Sister Christina Marie. I know she's getting embarrassed right now, but we're going to sing happy birthday to Sister Christina Marie. So, I have to, I have to admit, uh, so we're so grateful to have the sisters here. They came all the way out from Spokane, uh, and they had to fly, and I had to purchase their, their plane tickets for them, which meant that they had to send their date of births to me, and I noticed <laughs> that today was Sister Christiane Marie's birthday. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge her, but let's bring up both Sister Christiana Marie and Sister Pasqualina for taking the time to come and just be with us this weekend. So if you don't mind, you come up to the stage. Uh, and we have a, just a small gift of, of appreciation. We have a rosary to give to each of them uh, because I know that they've been praying for us. We've been praying for you to come here, and we're so grateful that you would spend your time so a, uh, a rosary for each of you. Uh, how many of you bought some socks this weekend? Yeah, aren't they awesome, the sock religious? So as a small token of our appreciation, we wanted to give Sister Christiana Marie uh, a pair of socks. And they <laughs> so thank you so much for being here, and I think Jamie's going to lead us in a happy birthday. 
Absolutely. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. chance to um, hear some question and answers with our lovely Father Kirby. Um, so let's give him a warm welcome. The man, the myth, the legend. All right, here you go, Father Kirby. Hey, good to be here with you. I usually have people like write down questions and hand them in because that's a little more anonymous, but do that this time, so we just have to be courageous and ask whatever questions you want to ask. I don't like holding a microphone, so I'm going to do this. Is it going to work? No. This one works now. questions. subject. So I grew up a Spurs fan, Manny Ginobili. Amazing. Uh, I was always also a Tim Duncan fan. They just got too good. I got tired of it. In 2006, I switched over to the Warriors. Because in 2006, the Warriors were pre-Curry days. No, Baron Davis. It was a great team. Loved, loved the Warriors. They just started winning in an absurd and annoying way. So now, I don't know, it's complicated because then I followed, Le I just love LeBron. So I went to Cleveland and then LeBron left Cleveland now. I'm just like, oh, homeless kid in the NBA. I just don't know where, where to go. I don't want to go to LA. I'm not, that's, I can never be an LA fan. I don't know. If someone later wants to try and convince me, I'm, 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 I'm a free agent, I guess. Niners. of celibacy, I, so both, I, I would say, so the priest is in a very real way married to the church. And, and so I consider myself, I guess, in a, in a real way off the market. I'm, I'm taken by the church. Like I, I am, I have given my whole life to the church in a concrete enough way that like I, I need to, in a sense, give a visible sign. And, I, and so most of the time I'm a cleric sonnet, so that's a visible sign that I'm, I'm a priest. I'm, I'm in a sense like my heart is claimed. But I wear the ring because a lot of times I'm not wearing my clerics, so whether I'm going to work out or whether I'm doing a lot of other things. So it's just a, another way of sort of showing it and reminding myself uh, that my heart is claimed by the church and by Jesus. So I grew up, I grew up a Methodist, and I was sent to Catholic schools mostly 
because it was a family tradition to go to the Billing Central. And so we got we got some Rams in the house. Nice. Let me see. Okay, so so I I went to Billing Central for from about si from sixth grade until and it was about my junior year when I finally like woke up for a religion class, I guess. I, I think I just straight did not pay attention the first seven years because I was like, I'm not Catholic, I don't really care. So I, uh, I sort of, I guess, it was actually in studying, I loved history. So it was, we were studying the history of the church, and so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll pay attention to this. I actually wanted to find out the history of the Methodist church because I didn't know anything about it. And it was actually through studying sort of the Reformation and, and everything surrounding that. So a lot of like the corruption in the church and the crazy things surrounding that that I actually grew to sort of love the church in a new way and, and be open to it. And then and then at the same time, I was going through a lot of struggles and, and ended up sort of starting to go to adoration for some odd reason. I was, I was invited by a couple of friends. And so I started praying. And then one day I was sitting in class and my professor was like, uh, my teacher, I guess, in high school. He just made me read John chapter 6 for the whole class. It's kind of strategic. It's smart on his part. And so, it, which is about the Eucharist. It's about Jesus kind of giving his disciples the Eucharist, the teaching on uh, his body and blood being given. And uh, so I read through it, and then he's just like, turns to me, he's like, Kirby, what do you think about that? I'm like, I don't know, I don't really have any thoughts about it. He's like, read it again. So he made me read the whole chapter again. He's like, what do you think about that? I'm like, well, I don't know, Jesus said it. So I guess that's cool. He's like, do you believe it? And then I kind of just sit there and I was like, yeah, I believe it. And then that kind of literally changed my life. I, I, I think I just like went to the bathroom, but I didn't. I just like left and walked around for about the rest of the class. And, and like once I believed in the Eucharist, then it was like, I have to become Catholic because there's no, there's, I, I can sort everything else out later. And it did take me a long time to sort everything else out, but, uh, and a lot of reading, but, and then once I came into the church, I was immediately discerning priesthood because in, in a naive way, it was like, what's the next step? You know, I'm a Catholic, now what do I do next? I become a priest. So it was sort of naive, but the Lord, the Lord worked that out in time. And so it was all through college, I kept discerning and staying open to that. And, uh, and then by the end of college, I just felt certain that the only reasonable next step was go to seminary. So I went straight through, I'm, I was ordained when I was 27, pretty young. But the Lord took care of that. I've been, I mean, not be happier. Never could have imagined it. I thought by now I'd be a, a dentist. Some of my friends are just just graduated dental school. What was your favorite part of convention? And you can't say your own talk. Oh, okay. Other than my own talk, my favorite part of, part of convention. Actually, uh, I gotta give a shout out to Jamie Clayton. I that guy's awesome. Uh, this time's planning on stealing a ton of his material for myself. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of a great little, great little prop maneuver. Also, Mass with Monsignor last night was amazing. Monsignor O'Neill is just, just such a holy and great dude. He loves you guys. You don't have to applaud every single one of my answers, by the way. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, next question. Hardest part, hardest part of being a priest. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's. I mean, I, I feel like I'm closing out in two years, which is crazy, but it's, I'm still sort of in honeymoon phase, I guess. I, I still like have tons of energy, so I'm like super pumped about everything. I would say the hardest, the hardest part has been you know, I found it surprisingly hard, even as a priest, to make time for prayer. So I, I pray a holy hour every morning, and it is so easy to let a million other things invade that. And I don't mean like, like I, I do, I, like I put in the time, but it's like, does that just become prepping for Sunday Mass? Does it become prepping for this talk? Does it become prepping for my teaching at Butte Central? Does it, I, I, can, I can turn that holy hour into a million different things, and it, and it and it will immediately not become like just being with the Lord. So I know, and that's crazy because that's literally my job. 
is to pray. So like, it's the number one thing I'm supposed to be doing, and it's hard. Like, so I know your guys' struggles. Like, you guys have a million other things to do, and it's not literally your job. Well, it is, as a Christian, your job to pray. But it's in a little more remote sense. I'm a priest. Like, I am asked 50 times a day to pray for things, so I actually have to do that. So I, that's been the hardest part in, in one sense. And then in other, in other ways, I guess, uh, so like I was at the Butte, I was at the St. Patty's Day Parade the other day, and I was looking around, and I was like, you know, this, this year compared to last year, I know way more people. But I was still looking out, and I was like, there's 30,000 people in Butte. And like, I don't want to get emotional right now, but like, I'm responsible for their souls. And, and I don't know them. Like, there's so many people here that I don't know. And there might have been a lot of people who weren't from Butte, so I'm like imposing that on myself unnecessarily. But there were a lot who were. And I'm like, I'm responsible for their souls, and I don't know them. So, like, the mission sometimes is sort of overwhelming, and I guess that's hard and, like, spurs me on at the same time. So, I guess, yeah. Um, is there something that you have to tell people that you know about the Catholic faith? One thing, wondering about the Catholic faith. So, I, I talked about the Eucharist, which I think was literally the game changer for me, but... I, I spoke at a, at a, what was like a sort of ecumenical thing the other day, and it was a, a ton of the evangelical churches in town, and then me and a couple of Catholics were there, and, and we were, we did like praise and worship and then spoke, and I guess I would say to think, when we think about the Catholic Church, we think about like, in, in a very real way, it's, it's like, the church that's been here for 2,000 years, and whether or not, if you're not Catholic and you, like, are wondering about the truth of that, uh, versus, like, the churches of the Reformation, or even the Eastern Orthodox Church, like, in today's world, we need unity in the Christian church, and I don't mean unity and like, come together and do praise and worship from time to time, but the world is getting harsh, like, it's, it's getting hostile to Christianity, and if we aren't unified in the way that we confront that, then we're in trouble. And I found in the Catholic Church, like, the place where we're going to be unified. Uh, it's the, I, I, th I believe, in, in the end, that it's the fullness of the truth, and, and that, that, is the, that is the church that Christ founded, and that it's the place where we're going to, in a sense, come together uh, to give a unified front to the world. Um, and, and it's the one that, that Christ said, the, the gates of hell will never prevail against. And we know that from experience because of the terrible corruption that's existed in the church for the last 2,000 years, and the gates of hell have not prevailed against it yet. So, I mean, Napoleon was talking to a, a cardinal in, in Rome as he was conquering Italy, and, he's, and he told the cardinal, he's like, I will destroy the Catholic Church. I will destroy the Catholic Church. And the Cardinal just kind of waved his hand. He's like, Napoleon, we Cardinals have been trying to destroy the Church for 1,800 years. <laughs> we haven't managed it. So, like, you're not going to destroy it, <laughs> you little Frenchman. So, so like, it's, it, it, it's not like, that, that was in a sense, like, as great a proof to me as anything. Uh, but, but I would say, actually, if, if, if someone's wondering about the Catholic Church and they're going to look at one thing, go to John chapter 6 and, and Jesus teaching on the Eucharist. Uh, because and it, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of difficult teachings in the Catholic Church. The moral teachings, the teachings on the sacraments, the teachings on the priesthood, they're all difficult. But if we believe in the Eucharist, then we just have to trust that the Lord, like, the Lord wouldn't give that and then a lot of other crazy stuff with it, you know, like, that's his body and blood, and if it is, then, like, believe that, believe his words on that, and then, like, in time, look into all those other things in the Lord, and, and, and like, you will come to, like, it takes a lot more time, I would say, to reason through those other teachings, but they are all true. so bad with jokes. I never remember jokes. I think 10 times 
this day. I need to remember that joke. Uh, I'm blanking on a single joke. I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to that. I'll remember one by the end of this, by the end of this Q&A session. So, I think my, my favorite thing about Catholic youth, so I, we did our junior retreat for Butte Central the other day, and, and I, I'm always amazed by, we were, we were just kind of just staying up late and doing a sort of informal q and I guess kind of like this, but with, with way less people, so way less informal, I guess. And I'm always amazed by, like, the, the imagination of Catholic youth. So it's like, so Father, like, how, it, can there be aliens? And like, what does that have to do with the cross? And like, how does the cross relate to aliens? And like, so is Jesus, like, how does that work? And then so we're talking about aliens. And and then, so like, what about, uh, just like crazy, <laughs> crazy questions. And the, the, the innocent exploration of the church and, and what all of that, I have real questions about the world because I'm a young person who's coming into the world and, and like about to have to confront it. And both really hard questions, but also just like really creative and weird questions. And so there's just a lot of energy there that I love, and that's pretty much why I spend um, and also you're the future, like you're the future of the church in a very real way, and the and the church is um, everyone's really pessimistic about the future of the church, but I'm super awesome optimistic. Uh, that's why I choose to spend like 98.3% of my time with youth. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm pumped up about the energy, about the, like the truth seeking without an agenda, um, and just about exciting weird questions, I guess. What's up? Did you use Father Mark in a basketball game? No. Unless my three ball was like really hot. But he's, he's, got, he's got that old man craft. That. Like he's. Uh, do, does anyone remember John Stockton when he was like 42 playing in the NBA? That's Father Mark is that right now. He's like in his prime. Because I mean, he's just yeah. He's got that craft master. And I think even like my. I don't even have the left hand advantage because he's a lefty. So I. No. I could. I'd be interested in it for sure. I. Well, I, I, this might be inappropriate, but I, I don't, I, so there was like one fight at New Central last year, one fight in a whole school year. I did not say that, that's a mystery. I have it on video. I said he's got old man crap. I know young people with old man crap. So, what was the, what were we, what were we just talking about? <laughs> no, fighting, fighting, so. At, at Mute Central. Right, yeah, that's more reasonable. So, at Mute Central there was one fight all school year last year. Yet, yet like, there was a tremendous amount of bullying, it's just all like the online bullying. And I'm of the opinion that, that it's honestly slightly more healthy, still unhealthy, to just fight it out than to just like destroy someone on social media. Uh, so I'd say like if you have a problem, like go and talk to a person, but if, if punches are thrown, that, that's nature. Uh, I mean, we need grace. We need grace to perfect our nature. But I think that's more natural than like, going on Instagram and just crushing them uh, behind their back. So, I don't know. Neither is healthy. But I just, I've been surprised at how little fighting is. Oh, hold on a second. Well, actually, interestingly, when I became a Catholic, it was 
just so it was just me and my dad. My sister wanted to become a Catholic by then, but she hadn't because she was doing tra traveling physical therapy and couldn't get through an RCA. So I, I came into the church and my dad had left. And then so my mom hated the idea of me being a priest. Hated it. She was never like not supportive, but she'd say stuff like, your sister's getting old and your brother's a super weird artist and I, I don't know if I'm going to have any grandkids. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that, that's like you basically saying don't become a priest. And then, uh, but then, so, then my mom <laughs> converted and became Catholic. And then that, that really changed her heart on that. And she kind of uh, became supportive after that. And that was, I think, I don't, that was toward the end of college. So I wasn't quite in seminary yet. And then my brother, my brother became Catholic. Everybody in my family is Catholic now. So my dad, in a very roundabout way, fulfilled his obligation to raise his Catholic by <laughs> sitting back and watching. <laughs> and, and hopefully praying you know, <laughs> for us. Uh, so, but then he, so then actually he returned to the church. And so we're all, you know, all church going now. So it's great. What's up? Who's your favorite saint and why? Favorite saint. This is a tie between St. Francis and St. Joseph. I couldn't, I don't remember who I put as my confirmation saint. I think I might have put a both. I don't know if that's allowed. But St. Joseph for me is a, an incredible example of a chaste father. So, like every man who's discerning priesthood, at, like especially at the beginning, is like, yeah, I want to be a priest, but I want to be a dad. It's like, of course you do. If you don't want to be a dad, don't be a priest. But, but St. Joseph is that great example of like, Someone who is literally like a, like a foster father, like raising a child, but is also has that like chaste love, uh, because obviously, you know, the Blessed Mother remains a virgin forever. So, so he he is like an actual father, and has that chaste heart. And so he's always been a great model for me as a priest of like what does that fatherhood look like? Um, and he's a humble man, and he's silent. And I so I got to visit the tomb of Saint Joseph in Jerusalem, and it's this really, so it's the church where Mary was assumed. So everybody goes in the church and they walk straight down the steps and to the right, and it's the spot where Mary was assumed. And if you walk, if you don't do that, if you walk halfway down the steps and turn left, there's this little side altar, and it's where the body of St. Joseph is. And I walked in and no one was there. No one even knows that that's the case. And so, like, I'm sitting there with St. Joseph, I'm like, you have willingly been forgotten. Like, you are gladly ignored because you want all the attention to go to Jesus and Mary. And I'm like, oh, that's the kind of man I want to be. Like, where, like, if, if there's, you know, I, I sometimes you go to a priest's funeral and they're like a really old priest and they sort of outlived everyone that they served. <laughs> and so there's like almost no one at their funeral. And I'm like, some people are like, that's so sad. There's no one at Father's funeral. I'm like, you know what? It's our job. Like, we're, our job is to serve faithfully, and if no one remembers our name, but people go to heaven, praise the Lord. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the role of the priest, and so uh, that's, that's like, St. Joseph's always inspired me. Uh, and then St. Francis is just like one of the greatest saints in the history of the church, so, yeah. Oh, well, there's a lot of great St. Francis's, but Assisi is St. Francis Assisi. I've always been, I've loved the outdoors, so he, uh, his like lifting up of nature to God in a very real way. Also, there's this great, there's this great line where, like, so St. Francis went and preached to the birds, and everyone's like, oh, St. Francis is so great, he preached to the animals. I'm like, and I remember a Franciscan telling me, he's like, St. Francis only preached to the animals because people wouldn't listen. He's like, and then the animals listened, and people thought, maybe we should listen. <laughs> so that, that, that's a great line. If I was a priest, what would I be? You know, I have no clue. I, I, switched, I switched my ideas of what I wanted to be like 50 times while I was in college. I ended up with three majors because I just kept accumulating majors because I didn't know what to do. But I, so, I don't know. I, I went to lunch with a priest my first year of seminary. And we were sitting there, and he's like, so how's seminary going? I'm like, no, it's really great. He's like, what are your major in undergrad? And I was like, oh, history, philosophy, and classics. And, He's like, what, uh, he's like, what was that about? I'm like, well, I was thinking law toward the end of college before going 
going in, and I was like, and I, you know, that'd be cool. I'd probably do that if I left the seminary. He's like, don't have a plan B. It's like, okay. He's like, man, if you're holding anything back, it's like, if you have any secondary plans, just leave. It's like, don't have a plan B. Um, and so that was that was good for me. Is like, if you're gonna if you're gonna go, go. And if the Lord calls you out, He'll tell you what to do. So I, honestly, I don't know. Maybe a lawyer, maybe a history professor somewhere, maybe. <laughs> You know, I love teaching, so I, I teach anyways as a priest, so that's maybe something I'd be interested in, but um, I'm going to be a priest till the day I die, and then hopefully in heaven for all eternity, so I'm pretty pumped about that. Checkers? Uh, I'm not great at checkers, but it's not a super complicated game, so I have no clue. Depends on whether Pope Francis is a checkers master or not. But I think I'd be—I think I could beat Pope Francis in a basketball game. <laughs> so it's from Argentina. I mean, they're, they're <coughs> most rewarding part of being a priest, I'd say, for like the mass, celebrating mass is amazing. That's obviously the number one, and it's and it's like that's my role. Uh, Praying, praying for people in my parish is an incredible gift as a priest, especially because it's not just, I, it feels different than just when I prayed for friends before because, like, I actually have a role as intercessor. Uh, I would say on the day-to-day, -day, so, like, the day-to-day, -day, the unexpected joys have been in teaching <laughs> at Butte Central. I love teaching at Butte Central. I, like, that just pumps me up so much. I... It's exhausting. Like, I get to writing my lesson plans at, like, 11 p.m. It's, it's miserable sometimes. But, like, I love teaching. So that's been an unexpected joy. I, yeah, I'd say that's probably about all I mean. One or two more. No, I haven't. And, you know, I've, I'd say for the first time as a priest, like a couple, it was like a month ago, I had this, I had like a feeling of loneliness. And it was super foreign to me because I hadn't even had that as a priest. And I like, I felt lonely for a little bit. And I remembered, I remembered a, a, one of our formators who was a priest in the seminary was talking to us and said, when you feel that sense of loneliness, like don't run from it. And this is like a general piece of advice for everyone who's feeling lonely. Don't run from it, but like push into it and ask the Lord why that feeling of loneliness has come up. So I, at that moment, had the grace to actually like do that, which I think is probably, I don't know if I had done that before in my life. But I like sort of pushed into that and realized like that loneliness was actually a really interesting solidarity with someone who I just talked to who was extremely lonely, like lonely to the point that they were like considering suicide actually. And so I had like the grace of, in a sense, feeling their loneliness for an evening. And so I, as a priest, I, I don't know if I'll ever have feelings of like wanting to leave the priesthood. One of my really good friends from seminary uh, was actually just, was actually just, was just left. And, and I, like I'm going to be a priest till the day I die. I say that right now knowing that. Like, in the way that I think a married couple should say, I'm going to be married to this person until the day I die. Like, you can't take an attitude other than that. Whether or not I'll feel like that always, probably not, because our feelings are, you know, they're all over the place. Um, but that's the decision I've made. Um, and I think that loneliness, that any sort of doubt I'm going to feel is most likely the Lord, like, helping me feel sort of some sort of solidarity with other people who feel that way. Um, so that's what I've felt so far. Did God kill the dinosaurs? Did God kill the dinosaurs? No, so if he came to our talk on evil, well, one of them we talked about natural evils, uh, that was probably just an asteroid or a ball, uh, multiple volcanoes or a super tornado I've heard recently, maybe. Uh, super tornado might have killed the dinosaurs. Or a combination of all three, which would be pretty cool. Uh, did God create dinosaurs? Oh, yeah, God created everything. 
Absolutely. I mean, we can have a conversation about all this, but that's a long conversation. <laughs> We're going to talk about Genesis, like it's a Bible study on the first three chapters of Genesis, and it's a long one. Okay. Uh, what I think of Jennifer, sorry. Uh, do you remember the joke? Oh, the joke. No. <laughs> in a CC, actually there were two places. When I was in a CC, I thought about becoming a Franciscan. I think if you're a man and you're in a CC and you don't think about becoming a Franciscan, you're just not paying attention. <laughs> uh, but I, actually, the, one of the trips to Rome, a guy thought that and, and tried to dump his girlfriend because, and he's like, I'm starting being a Franciscan. I don't think we can go out anymore. And she's just like, no. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? She's like, you're not dumping like, but I'm discerning a She's like, that's a terrible excuse. You're not dumb. <laughs> and and she, she saw right through the whole thing. Now they're married and have like two kids. So it all worked out. And, and the consent was valid. It wasn't coerced. Uh, he was just having a moment in CC like every guy does. And then the other time was I was down in Wyoming with the Carmelite monks down there. And I thought this would be a beautiful life. But when it came down to it, I love Montana and I never want to leave. Every time I have to leave Montana, I, I throw a tantrum. And it's weird, and I'm like, I I hate it. I hate leaving Montana. So my it seemed it always seemed obvious to me that my call was like I was going to be in Montana for the rest of my life no matter what. That seemed like part of my call, and so diocese and priesthood always seemed pretty obvious because it's like I'm be, I'm going to be in Montana, and so that makes sense. Uh, I think that's all we got. I'll be around. Next day. So first thing, can I get the Cathedral Parish to come up for the DMC? Can we get that group to come up? Wow. Cathedral Parish. Please come up and stand up. Um, before, and before we do the DMC, while the Cathedral people are coming up, can I have everybody stand up? We're gonna, we've been sitting for a while, so we're going to do some quick stretching. Hands to the sky. to our Divine Mercy Chaplet, take it away, Cathedral Parish. Uh, so, as we agree, just offering this uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet up for any intentions that you guys have had in your hearts for the future of our parish. <laughs> uh, for any, well, that's not, okay, uh, we're just offering this Divine Mercy Chaplet up for anybody's intentions that they've had in their hearts this weekend. Um, we just pray that God hears our prayers um, and that he touches all of your hearts. sake of his sorrowful passion for the sake of his sorrowful passion for the sake of his sorrowful passion 
Also for praying so well. The Divine Mercy Chapel? Yeah. So, from the town of Power, which is the coolest town name ever, um, which has about 170 people, we have Jacob Bedeker here. Um, Jacob is quite the jack of all trades. He loves acting and singing, and he also plays three sports. It's pretty cool. So give it up for Jacob. trip to Minnesota to see relatives and the occasional floating down the irrigation ditch on an inner tube. In the fall, I'm hunting and playing football and starting school. Winters, I'm playing basketball and it seems always shoveling the driveway. In the spring, I'm practicing for the school play and still shoveling the driveway. All right. I was doing all this while going to church and youth group every Sunday. Now, I grew up in what someone might call a half-Catholic household, which was pretty much exactly what it was. My mom was a devout Catholic, but my father was non-religious. This made me feel like I was torn between two different worlds. I felt like I had two different lives. There was my church life, and then there was this other life. In church, I could talk to anyone and everyone about my faith and all sorts of other things. But at home, if Jesus... God or the church was ever brought up, it was kind of that awkward moment. Like it was one of those things that you're never told not to say, but that was definitely the vibe that was given off. 
in school it was no different. I go to a school that has a little over 30 kids in it, so there's kind of a pressure there to make sure everyone's comfortable, because there's only so many people that will talk to you and be your friend. All right. Needless to say, religion wasn't really on mine or anyone else's conversations outside of the church. All right, question for you. How many of us, at some point, find ourselves losing focus in church, not quite paying attention? Right, same here. <laughs> My church life wasn't anything special. I mean, I went to church every Sunday morning, mostly because my mom made me, and I was even an altar server, and I even had sacristan duties where I'd like to take, set up stuff and take stuff down before and after church. But I felt like something was missing. Things just didn't sit right. There was always this emptiness feeling when it came to church. Now, with confirmation starting this year, I wanted to try and fill those empty feelings so I wasn't trying to be confirmed into something I didn't fully believe. All sorts of questions ran through my head, like, how much of the Bible is real? How many of these miraculous tales that we've heard so much about are true, or are a lot of them just fishermen's tales that have grown way out of proportion? And then there's the question that probably everyone has asked at some point in their life, is God real? Just recently in chemistry class, we were discussing atoms and how they couldn't be seen due to a large amount of indirect evidence. Now, a class couldn't be seen, but we know they're there due to a large amount of indirect evidence. Gotcha, all right. Uh, then a classmate of mine, who tends to question everything, but he's non-religious, asks my science teacher, we can't see atoms, right? Mr. Ham, his last name is Ham, uh, replies, correct. Then Jace asked, if scientists believe in atoms, then why don't they believe in God? This got everyone thinking. <laughs> now during this time of questioning, I came upon the realization that I wasn't giving my full participation in church. I was doing what my mom called, fake it till you make it. I mean, I did a lot in church. I was an altar server, a sacristan, a lector even. I even sang in the choir. But with all these things, there was no personal relationship with God. There's no deep personal connection that, like the ones you'd heard so much about. I guess I was waiting for that St. Paul moment. You know, with the blinding light and the booming voice yelling, Believe. <laughs> um, I was never really trying to delve deep into my faith. I was just doing things that looked good on the outside, hoping eventually something would change on the inside. Now, with confirmation starting, came finding a service project. And, since I was already doing so much in the church, I wasn't really planning on doing anything different. But my mom, confirmation sponsor, and God had other ideas. Now, with my mom and being, my mom and confirmation sponsor being both uh, RE Pro, religious education program teachers in my church, they figured I should teach a class also that makes sense. All right. Uh, and so now I teach the second and third graders of my church. I have a grand total of three students, but usually only two show up, so it's not really that hard. But even with those two or three kids, I didn't want to sound like a hypocrite. If I was going to be teaching children on how to grow closer to God, then I should probably try and grow closer myself. Because of this, I started to really pay attention to Mass. I tried to, and tried to decipher the Bible on my own time, not just for an hour every Sunday. I started going to early morning Bible study, which helped a lot by giving us sort of refueling for the week. Uh, as I was doing this, there was a tiny filling up feeling after every Mass. Every little church-related thing seemed to add up. It became easier to open up, if not to my father or to my friends, but to myself. I was putting my trust in God to develop a relationship with Him. My religion that I had grown up in for 16 years was finally starting to make sense. Things were starting to add up. Uh, these little feelings started to become into slightly bigger ones and into even larger feelings of fulfillment. Fast forward to now while I'm saying all this, my personal connection with God has grown significantly. I feel more confident when talking or teaching others about my faith. Now, 
I will say, I'm not like the Pope or anything. It's gotten, I still have a bit to work on, but I do know that I will continue to try and to develop a deeper relationship with him. My challenge to you is to do the same. I challenge everyone in this room, whether you're a priest or someone who rarely ever goes to church, is just to try. Try to continue to develop a deeper personal connection with him. Try to do the small things and try to understand the little things in our faith. You can read the Bible a chapter every other night or do a, say a small <coughs> silent prayer every day. In 2 Peter chapter 1 it says, For this very reason make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Eventually, these small things will begin to add up. Eventually, while there may not be no lightning bolt moment, certain things may start to fall into place. Eventually, while your, relation, eventually your relationship with God will be so great that nothing can break it so long as you always keep trying. Thank you. senior in high school from Butte. Um, as Liz said, I love to be outside. I love to ski, canoe, um, and mountain bike. I'm the youngest of six kids and grew up in a really awesome and devout Catholic family. We went to Mass every Sunday. We went during the week when we could, and we prayed together almost every night. I also received a solid Catholic education, and faith was integrated into pretty much everything that I did. So basically, I'm your classic cradle Catholic. This all seemed pretty normal to me because it was just who we were and what we did. And although I loved being Catholic, I remember being pretty bored most of the time. When I was little, my mom used to take us to adoration. And I would sit in front with my like saint book and read for a little bit. And then I'd wander around to the back of the church where there's this devotional to Mary that's surrounded by votive candles. I'd go back there, make sure nobody was looking, and blow out all the candles. <laughs> and then relight them, because I knew you had to like pay $3 to light your own candle. But I hope there's not too many souls still in purgatory, because I blew out their candle. But fast forward a couple years to about eighth grade. That's when I started getting more involved um, with youth group. And I went to junior high rally, which is the junior high version of CYC. And I really enjoyed it. So my friend who had been involved with CYC was like, hey, I think you should join the CYC board. I think you'd really like it. So my freshman year, I joined, which was a really good and eye-opening experience for me because for the first time, I was surrounded by so many kids who were my age and on fire with their faith and actually excited about it. Um, and this was great for me because I felt like I didn't have to you know, be somebody different around these people. I didn't have to hide my Catholic identity. Um, so being on CYC board started a sort of relationship with God that went a little something like this. I would go to board meetings and encounter God and feel this real spiritual high, but then I would leave the board meeting and leave that encounter there too. And I think that's because I went from being so involved in my family's faith than to latching on to the faith of a very particular group of friends instead of like um, like taking those encounters with me and letting them change my own faith life. But looking back, I had a really blessed and awesome childhood. Nothing really terrible ever happened, but overall I was a pretty lukewarm kid. But my junior year, I learned three powerful lessons 
that helped me make my faith my own. Coming into last year, I was at a pretty low point spiritually and hadn't been feeling God's presence for almost four months, which started to weigh on me after a while. And at the second CYC board meeting, I had an encounter that made every day since then different. We were having adoration, and I was sitting on the floor right below the monstrance. And I decided to give everything that had been weighing on me to God and to surrender to him because it began, became too much for me to handle on my own. And in that moment of vulnerability, I felt this presence come and literally sit next to me on the ground with their arm around me. The feeling was so inexplainable, but it's like the person who loves you most ever giving you a hug and telling you that everything is going to be fine. It was like in that emptiness that I had been feeling, I was, there was finally room for God to reach out, and I was finally in a place to accept that invitation. And it's not that I hadn't encountered God before, it's that I had never accepted that and let it change the way I lived the rest of my life. So surrendering and saying yes to God was the first lesson that I learned, because it was in this encounter that I finally accepted my faith as my own. It was like my moment was just finally turning to God, who had been waiting for me the whole time. The next two lessons are the most practical ways that I found to live out that yes on a daily basis. The first is prayer. When I got home from this meeting, I knew something had to be different because I had made a promise to God and I was going to keep it, which meant making a daily commitment. So I started praying every day, which was really hard at first because I was not used to making time for God. But showing up to prayer is what counts. And God used, worked through that little by little, building our relationship. This is why prayer is so important. Because prayer just doesn't help our relationship with God. It is our relationship with him. The Catechism says, in the New Covenant, prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their Father, who is good beyond measure. And something that was really fun about starting to pray more consistently is that there are so many different kinds of ways to pray. Two of my favorite ways are the Rosary and Adoration, but there's the Divine Mercy Chapel, Lexio Divina, Liturgy, Liturgy of the Hours, and so many more ways that it's really just about finding a form of prayer that works for you and helps you consistently hit that stride with God. Starting to pray consistently totally transformed my spiritual life and my relationship with God. Because as St. Teresa of Avila says, Prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know who loves us. The second most practical way to live out that yes was through Christian friendship. Without friends who believe the same thing as you and support you in that, it's very hard to stay firm. I've been lucky to have my CYC friends and friends from my parish community and my siblings to lift me up when I'm struggling but if you struggle to find solid friends in your peer group, seek that out in your church community or pray to God to send you a good friend. Sirach chapter six says, faithful friends are a sturdy shelter. Whoever finds one has found a treasure. Faithful friends are beyond price. No amount can balance their worth. Faithful friends are a life-saving medicine and those who fear the Lord will find them. But this does not mean that our Christian friends become our foundation on which we build our faith. It means that they are our shelter, and they build us up as we strive towards sainthood together. Now, I'm being by no means perfect with all this. It's definitely been a journey that has had its ups and downs. But to wrap up here, I want to reflect a little bit about this weekend. You have all said a yes by being here, which has hopefully led to encountering God. You have learned and participated in many different styles of prayer. We did Liturgy of the Hours, we did the Divine Mercy Chaplet and Adoration, and hopefully you met some amazing people. But my challenge to you is to not let this weekend die when you go home. Take what you have experienced and learned and let it change you. And make that commitment to God by finding prayer that works for you and do it consistently. And lastly, seek out people who build you up in your relationship with God. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Ms. Margaret LeFay.
things. Give it up again for all our keynotes this weekend. So many beautiful stories and so many beautiful messages, and especially that one of surrender. I feel like that's definitely been a theme. We heard it in Jimmy, Jimmy Clinton's talk yesterday, and that's something I invite you guys to take with you. Um, I think on your way home, as you have your friends and your new friends that you might have that you might have made this weekend, which I hope all of you have made new friends. <laughs> Make sure that you, on your way home, that you turn to them and tell them one thing you want to change. What is one thing you want to take from this experience that you want to remember forever? So continue to do that and continue to take these new memories and this new journey with you. Rock on. All right. Next up, we have our last session with Jamie Clayton, so let's give him our undivided attention and get stoked. We'll see what he breaks this time. <laughs> you better hope it's not you. Ooh, ooh. It's going down. <laughs> Lord, that, that we would uh, we'd be naive to think that you did not ignite something within us, Lord. And I pray that that would come uh, to a fullness right now as we close up this meeting. That that would come to a fullness that's not just filled within us, but that we are sent on mission. And so I pray that this, uh, this final uh, last hour and a half, Lord, that you would just, um, just stoke that fire and just let it be one that, that does not just uh, dwindle, but one that, that spreads, Lord. Help us to be that saint you're calling us to be. Help us to find fullness and freedom in you and set us on fire this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, our topic for the weekend, right, is ignite, okay? You know, is this idea of being set on fire. I immediately thought of a story that is uh, kind of painful for me to talk about, but I decided I needed to. Um, so when I was in Austria uh, at the study abroad program, we had, um, we lived in this, uh, okay, um, and so we were going to FaceTime with some of our good friends back home. So a bunch of, uh, like the, I was talking about the household I was in, a bunch of us went, we were going to FaceTime with, with our friends. And so we were gathered in, and they were already in there, and they, like, I was in the hallway. They are like, Jamie, we got him, we got him. And so we got our friends who were back in the United States on uh, the, the computer. And so I run in, there's not really a seat, so I just jump up onto what I believe is a countertop, okay? <laughs> Uh, I also didn't know that someone had just been in the kitchen uh, cooking something before we had gotten in there. So I get down and I sit down, right? And I've been talking, also I like smell something burning. And I'm like, huh, what's that smell? 
you know? And then all of a sudden, like, my right butt cheek is like, and I'm like, what the, you know, I get up, you know, like, what is going on? And I am just like frying my butt, okay? You know, like, I, yeah, it was a, it was a tough week of classes uh, trying to sit in class. Um, <laughs> And I was like, I literally had not planned to tell that story, but I was sitting in the back, I was like, I feel like I need to say that. And, and I say that because uh, <laughs> I move real quick. You know, there, there's a tendency when we're on fire, there's a natural tendency to move. That's a good thing, okay? <laughs> That's a very good thing, that when you're on fire, to move, okay? And that's my hope is that you burn your butt this weekend and that you move, okay? And I think there's a tendency to come to these conferences or these conventions and to be moved. Oh, that, that keynote that, that Margaret gave was very, it, I was moved by it. That, that, uh, that homily that was given was, I was moved by it. That talk that was given, I was, that, that prayer that mass, I was moved by it. But listen to me very clearly. There's a difference between being moved by something and then actually moving. We need to actually move. Do not leave this building today and have this just be something that, that moved you. But when you get home, you need to be moving. You need to be moving. So you have a choice as you leave this weekend. You can let this weekend be one of two things. It can be a monument, or it can be a movement. So a monument would be like, you know, like, oh, I remember that one time I had like the, the game winning hit, and you know, my coach gave me the, the game ball, and I have it up on my, up on my trophy shelf, you know, there, and it's like, oh yeah, what a great monument to that moment. Or maybe, you know, you're like your sixth grade or eighth grade retreat, you know, like, oh man, we had so much fun, we bonded as a class, I still have photos from that, we still talk about it. Man, what a monument in my life. Or, this weekend can be a movement. Something that's not just a cool memory. Something that's not just like, oh, like, I have a picture, and we, 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 I have memories. But you look back on this weekend, and you're like, that's where it all changed. That's where everything was different from that point on. My prayer, my hope, is that this weekend is a movement for you. Not just a movement for you, but a movement for your entire community because of what you experienced, what you encountered this weekend. Now, immediately, I was thinking, I was like, how, like, what's a good example for us to know, like, how the heck do we make this a movement and not just a monument? And immediately, I thought of the apostles. I thought of like Acts of the Apostles. So I, like, I went to Acts of the Apostles. Like, I was like, that's a good place to start. Like, if you talk about having a profound encounter with Jesus Christ, I would say the Apostles did. Okay? You know, they, they literally had an occupation change completely. They had a vocational change. And like, their entire world was flipped upside down for three years after they met Jesus Christ, right? You know, they saw that dude. They saw him, you know, like heal people. They saw him walk like thousands of miles, they, they got to know him personally as like a best friend, they saw him rise from the dead, you know, they saw miracles and their life was just flipped upside down. But then, they had this like dramatic set of circumstances where he died, he rose, he appeared again, and then he went and he's like, deuces, I'll see you in heaven. You know, and they're like, uh, you know, what do we do now? And that's the question we're all left with right now. The same thing after Jesus went to heaven, the apostles were left with, uh, what do we do now? And that's what I want to talk about in this talk. That's where we can talk about what is it to be a movement in your life so that we're not stuck with the, uh, what do we do now? So we go to Jesus left, and where are the apostles? They're in the upper room. And what were, does anyone know, this is right before Pentecost, spoiler alert, does anyone know what they were doing in the upper room before Pentecost? They were hiding. They were scared. 
They had their life radically changed, and it was all centered around Jesus Christ. And they had this emotional, physical thing with Jesus Christ, and then he left, and then they're like, okay, we're kind of like wanted, like they just killed Jesus, like, and we know he rose in the dead, and we know he's in heaven, but like they kind of want to kill us, and they didn't know what to do. They were in that upper room, just, uh, what do we do now? And then Pentecost happens. And what an incredible transformation. What a movement, not just a monument. Man, they, they gathered together. They prayed for the Holy Spirit to come. The room shook. The wind gushed through, and they, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what did they immediately do? They went out and evangelized. They went from, like, talk about a, a flipping a switch. Talk about just not just being moved, but literally moving. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're like, I know what I need to do. And they all went out, and they evangelized. Scripture says they evangelized over 5,000 people that day. Day. That day, they evangelized 5,000 people. That is the power of the Holy Spirit right there, that it can take a person within one hour who is hiding, scared, not knowing what to do, not knowing how God can move this mountain in your life, to the next day going out and evangelizing 5,000 people, all because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe you're scared. Maybe just you hearing me say those words of like, you want me to go out and talk to people about the Lord? You expect me to go and, and talk to people about what I experienced this weekend? You expect me to go home and create community? You expect me to start a prayer? You expect me to do this whole Jesus thing? Maybe that scares the crud out of you. Also, maybe that's a good thing. Because we're not going to be able to do it ourselves. And the key that we see from the Acts of the Apostles, the key about making this a movement, not a monument, has to do with the second person of the Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. Sorry, did I just say that wrong? <laughs> Third. <laughs> Third. <laughs> I heard that come out. So. Wait. There we go. Okay. The Holy Spirit. Now, what's important to know about the Holy Spirit is it with, you know, we call him the person, like the person of the Holy Spirit, right? That with a person comes a relationship. I feel like we understand that with Jesus. It's like, oh, yeah, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or even with God the Father, you know? Oh, yeah. And then when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we're like, yeah, that's that, like, you know, it's like that dove, fire, you know, like Casper the Friendly Ghost sort of thing. You know, and, like, it's like, it's like, you know, we look at him, it's kind of like karma. You know, and it's like, no, like, we believe he's a the person of the Holy Spirit. And with the person comes a relationship. And I would bet that a lot of people here have a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ, with the person of God the Father, and with the person of the Holy Spirit. We just seem to not, we like skip the relationship part. So I want to dive into that a little bit. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit because this, to me, this is the key. It was the key for the apostles for how to move this forward. So vis-a-vis, -vis, it's the key for us. The Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit? I, and this is, this is going to be a funny analogy, okay? Uh, but I think you're used to that with me by now. Okay, so I always equate the Holy Spirit to a couple friends of mine, okay? So I've got a friend, Mike Gray, and a friend, Kevin Spenler. They don't know each other. They're separate areas of my life. But for some reason, they remind me of who the Holy Spirit is. Uh, my friend, Mike Gray, me and him were, were co-captains co on the soccer team in college, and the dude was just fearless. I don't know if you know anyone like that. Like, he was also kind of nuts. Like, he just, like, he never, I love hanging out with him because you never knew what he was going to do. Like, we'd be sitting at lunch at, like, October time, and the cafeteria has, like, pumpkins on the table, and he would just grab the pumpkin and start walking. And you're like, there he goes. You know? <laughs> and we're like, where's he going? And then he sneaks up to the top of the cafeteria and just throws it off the top of the cafeteria. Like, what do you, you know, like, there was always, like, like, what's wrong with you? And yet, at the same time, it was kind of always, like, it kept it exciting. Like, it was like you were always on your toes. And one of my favorite moments with Mike Gray was we were sitting, the, the soccer team always got to the cafeteria for dinner late because we had practice, and we'd, like, run in and be there, like, two minutes before it closes. And then the cafeteria, cafeteria workers are like, oh, you know, and, like, so we, we get in there, and we're eating uh, dinner together, and there was this new station at the cafeteria. And when you're on a college campus and they add something new to your cafeteria, 
It's a big deal, okay? You'll understand, okay? And so they add this new thing to the calf, okay? Also, college students don't have enough time to take cafeteria, so we call it the calf, okay? So, um, so they added the new thing to the calf, and it was, brace yourself, a bread station. <laughs> yeah, fresh bread that you go up there. Is it cut for you? No, you cut it yourself, okay? So you go up there, and they have these, like, French spaghettes or all these things, and you go up there and you just like get to slice, like, oh yeah, and you like butter it up, you know, and it's like bread. There was a little bit of hysteria on campus with how excited people were about this bread station, okay? <laughs> and so I remember Mike Ray, he, he goes up to the bread station and, and he like goes up there and he grabs one of the, 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 the big French baguettes and he like cuts the end off. And he walks over to where we're at, at the soccer, uh, soccer table. And he starts just gutting it. And we're like, what? What is he doing? You know? And then, and then he like leaves the bag at the table and he just goes around the cafeteria with the tray and he starts grabbing it. He gets fruit noobs, he gets beets, he gets french fries, he gets spinach, he gets mashed potatoes, he gets some Pepsi, and he comes and he the gutted out baguette, he just starts filling with these things. Okay. <laughs> and then he takes some of the bread that he had gutted out and kind of puts a little end cap on it, right? Yeah. He goes back to the bread station and just places it there. <laughs> and then we just sat there and watched as person after person went up, so excited, you know, they're like, oh, look at the bread station. They get up there, they grab the knife, and they cut it, and the thing just, like, oozes out, like, fruit loops, Pepsi, mashed potatoes, spinach, and, like, every time the person's like, you know, like, and then they, they all had the same reaction, which was not to go tell anyone, it was just like, they just walk away, you know? And then Mike would go back up and set it back up, and then like, oh, it was one of, it was so entertaining. You know, it was just the spice of life right there. Uh, it, was, it was ridiculous. So my friend Kevin, so my one time, so Kevin is originally from Arizona, okay? There is nothing to do in Arizona, okay? And uh, the, so I was there during the summer, which was, I don't know what I was thinking, but I was there during the summer. It was like a nice 115 degrees. Okay, so they just literally cocoon themselves in their AC all day long, and then they like all of a sudden they come out at like 9 p.m. Like people start coming out of their doors, and like hey, and then there's like a party in the streets at 9 p.m. Good, and so uh, because it's like it's a hundred, you know, and uh, so we were trying like you know we were watching movies all day AC, and all of a sudden um, Kevin and my friend David come by, uh, and, and they, they walk in the door, and we're all just sitting there lounging. You know, and so like come outside, come outside. So we step out into the, 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 the planet of the sun. And so we come out there and and all of a sudden, Kevin holds up, lifts it up. Keep in mind, we're in the middle of Phoenix, okay? We're not exactly in the wilderness here, okay? In the middle of like suburban area. And just lifts up a giant deer head. Just seven. Like <laughs> Now, maybe that's a strange view from Montana, okay, but as a San Diegan, I was like, what? You know, like, why, uh, so many questions, you know, like, why do you have that? Where did you get that? Like, what's wrong with you? And, and, and he's like, I was walking through the alley on my, my way back from work to come meet up with you guys, and I found this in the dumpster. Was like, it was like a 10-point, like, buck, like, what with a, with a, a, a trash bag and duct tape, you know, around the neck, you know, like, what? And so, we're, and so Kev's like, we got to do something. And <laughs> I was like, naturally, you know? And so, so we, we uh, my friend Ross had his, like, mom's minivan, and so we all piled in the minivan with the deer head, and we just started driving around downtown Phoenix with someone in the front seat with the deer head. <laughs> and we pull up the stoplights, and then we just like have the deer head go. <laughs> you know, and people are freaking out. We went by this uh, Arizona State University right there, a big college town, there was like this row of all the bars down there, right? And so we go by, and we're driving by, and we slowly open the sliding doors. We're going by, and we kind of honk the horn to get like, all the parties, like their attention. And then we just had the deer head like go out like this. And all the college students with their red solo cup just watch them. And they go, hey! You know, like, it was like hilarious. It was one of the most entertaining nights of my life. So, 
My great Kevin's there. Holy Spirit, okay? Like, they, it, life was so interesting with them. <laughs> It is so easy. I haven't seen Mike Ray in a long time, but I, Kevin, Kevin now lives in San Diego, so I get to see him all the time. He's, I can tell you many Kevin stories. But, dude, I think something, like, for me, my life as a Catholic growing up, uh, if you asked me to describe it in one word, I would have said born. And it wasn't until I had a encounter with the Holy Spirit, where I prayed for the Holy Spirit to enter me more fully, where, like, in conjunction with confirmation, where, like, the Holy Spirit became a person to me, a relationship to me that really, like, my life as a Catholic became fun. Like, the Holy Spirit is like the mover and the shaker. It's like always keeping you on your toes. Like, the Holy Spirit's kind of weird sometimes, you know? Like, like the Holy Spirit asked the apostles to do a lot of weird things, you know? Like, people in, in Acts of the Apostles were healed from St. Peter's <laughs> Kleenex. You know, like, there was, like, weird things, and it's like, it, it keeps you on your toes, and if you want, like, if you're bored at all in your faith, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is the answer to that because life gets interesting in what you're asked to do, and it really becomes that adventure. So the Holy Spirit often overlooked, like I was talking about, but it's very important. And so I want you to know who the Holy Spirit is. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit animates all creation, awakens faith, enables communication with Christ, grants <laughs> gifts to all, is the master and source of all prayer. He reveals God, reveals <laughs> Trinity, and is the source of all holiness. That's a good resume right there. You know, like, that's like, I'd say rather important. And yet the Holy Spirit is kind of the forgotten member of the Trinity. The one we don't have a relationship with. The Holy, it was through the Holy Spirit that God spoke to the prophets of the Old Testament. It was through the Holy Spirit. All of the Bible was written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. The apostles of Pentecost, the very beginnings, the birthplace of the church happened after Pentecost when the Holy Spirit poured down in a radical way. The Holy Spirit is very, very important. The Holy Spirit is that mover shaker. The Holy Spirit is the source of all life in the church. And if you don't have a, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, this is not going to be a movement. It's going to be a monument. So now the question comes, what does he do? What does he do in our life? And that is the fact that he brings power. With the Holy Spirit comes power. There's this part of scripture. I think it is one of the most powerful lines in all of scripture. <coughs> As Jesus, talking to his apostles, this is, this is uh, before Pentecost uh, and before Jesus rises, uh, sorry, goes into heaven, Right? And he says to his apostles, as they're kind of like worrying, like he's talking about how he's like going to send, he's going to leave. And, and he says to them this, listen to this, it's nuts. He says to them, it is better that I go. Because when I go, the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit will come and you will do even greater things than I did. Okay, let's think about that one for a second. Jesus Christ says it is better for us that he goes into heaven and sends you the Holy Spirit. Because when that happens, you will be able to do even greater things than Jesus Christ did when he was on this planet. Talk about a resume, rising people, like rising people from the dead, rising himself from the dead, walking on water, that'd be rad. You know, like, they're like all these different things, and he's saying you can do even greater things than I did. <coughs> when we begin to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, when we let the, the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit actually come to life within us, we have power in our lives. If you're scared to go back, home and live this faith or start a community or a Bible study and really do something in your parish, you're probably scared because you think it's all about you. But the great thing is, is it's not on you. You need to say yes, but then the Holy Spirit brings the power. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to make it happen. We kind of just got to show up and have faith. And there are still miracles happening today, guys. I have some friends that are doing some incredible miracle work. They're traveling around. They, they literally, they've seen like ACL injuries healed. They've seen people who are paralyzed. Like 
If you think miracles are a thing of the past, you're wrong. Because then you would be calling Jesus a liar who said, when you were filled with the Holy Spirit, you will do even greater things than I did. There are miracles still happening all over this planet. If, and, and guys, it starts with me. I'll be honest. I've never, I've never like had a miracle happen through my faith. Like at least like one like Jesus did. And that's, that's on me. Because I'm not praying for it. I'm not asking for it. But the Holy Spirit is ready and willing. And we can see, you can see miracles in your life, literal miracles, if you were willing and ready to invite the Holy Spirit to a radical way into your everyday life. So how do we do that? How do we take this person of the Holy Spirit who's really important, this person of the Holy Spirit who's ready to bring power in a crazy, intense, awesome way into your life, how do we do that? So I mentioned to you guys that uh, I really like to surf, okay? So... Waves can be a really intense and powerful thing. I was talking to someone who said, like, they, they want to surf, but, like, they've gotten gnarly hit by waves. I think it was Margaret, yes. And, and like, waves can be powerful. And I remember, like, I, I've gone out. The biggest surf I've ever surfed in was I was in about, like, 14 to 15 foot waves, which are huge, okay? Like, that is, and going, like, the power, like, as soon as you, like, go through the wave, it's, like, curling and, and you push through it. It's like thunder hits behind you. Like that thing hits and like, I don't know how water like shakes, but like the water shakes as you like come through it. You're not even in the white water. You're like past it and just thunders behind you. Waves are a very powerful thing. And I remember like being in the surf, when you're trained to surf in these big waves, um, you're going to fall and you're going to get like pounded. And so I remember when I was being kind of trained, like when I was little, like how to handle big waves. Um, these, these powerful waves was, was this, that the tendency is so like, let's say it's called going over the falls where it's like, you're like in the tube and then all of a sudden you get sucked up and then poof, you go down with the wave and you get sent under. Okay. <laughs> uh, some of the big wave servers, the guys who surf like 50 foot waves, right. They can be under for minutes. They have to be able to hold their, their breath for literally over two minutes in order to do that. Okay. So it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, but what you're trained to do, your natural instincts when you go under <laughs> is to just start like your breast running out, you kind of like every, you're, you flip around is you just want to start swimming, right? You want to like get to the surface to be able to swim. But actually what you're trained to do is to go against your instincts of doing that. And they say, if you go down like that, go limp and just let the wave take you. Let the power of the wave take you. It's going to take you deep. And it says, just go limp. And you remain calm until it kind of clears. Because if you start swimming in that moment, you could actually, not even knowing it, be swimming down. And thus making it even more dangerous. Because you got flipped on the side. So what you do is you just go limp and you let the wave take you. Until it clears, you open your eyes, and then you look for the bubbles. Okay? And the bubbles are always going up. So then the bubbles go up, and then you know which way to swim. And I think that's one of the greatest analogies for, like, how do we let the Holy Spirit work in our life? This power is our... We're not going to be able to just, like, pray harder, like, you know, like, you know, like, there's no, like, there's no Jedi mind trick of the, the louder you scream or the more, more profound you talk, the, the more powerful the Holy Spirit is. It's more, like we've been talking about, about surrender. It's more about, like, it's his work, not mine. I'm here to be a, a tool, an instrument towards that, and we kind of just let the power of the Holy Spirit take us. The people that I've met that, that are most powerful, like, like my, my grandma, uh, my mother, like these are people who are like just really filled with the Holy Spirit. Like they're just ready at any time. Like they'll, like my grandma actually just recently told me a story. She like had like some sort of uh, skin cancer come up and the doctor wanted to immediately do something. And she said, no, first let's let the, let's let the Holy Spirit have a chance to heal this. And the doctor's like, that's absurd. Don't, like, don't do that. Like that's, we can get this now really easy. She's like, no, I want to give God a chance first. Came back a month later and it's completely gone. And that doctor was like, there is no, there's no science to this. There, there's no reason for it. Like, that doesn't happen. And she's like, well, if you knew God, <coughs> you would know. Like, if we're ready in any way, if we're letting the Holy Spirit just move in our lives, we could be making a difference at doctor's appointments, checking out at grocery stores, like at our <laughs> schools, to our teachers. We could be setting this world on fire if we were filled with the Holy Spirit and letting his power take us. And 
when we do that, we're finally living. For me, that was so true. So a little bit into to, uh, little Jamie, okay? You saw Afro Jamie. You know, it was about, about that time period. I was a very fearful person. If you would have met me in junior high or high school, seriously, you would have not recognized me. First of all, my number one fear was public speaking. Second of all, I was not a confident person at all. I would barely speak up. I, would, I, was, I was a fearful, self-conscious person that just was kind of miserable. And I know for those guys who went to like my workshop, I mentioned like my converse, a lot of my like reversion of the Catholic faith happened through just silence in adoration. But really, it was before that. That was my version of like Catholic faith. But really, when I realized God was real was when I got prayed over for the Holy Spirit to really come into my life in a powerful way. Now, this is actually even like kind of before confirmation and then like fully kind of filled with, like with, with confirmation is that I did what the apostles did in that upper room of just complete 180. And that's only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he wants to do in your life. Whatever mountains you think are there, for me it was fear. I lived in constant fear. Maybe that's for you. The Holy Spirit wants to conquer. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's, it's, it's the past. Maybe it's, um, I don't know. I don't know what it is for you. But I'm sure you each have your mountain going out from here. Maybe that's isolation, not having community. Trust me, the answer, just like the answer was for the apostles of how to make this a, mo a movement, it's the Holy Spirit. It was for me, and it was for them. So I want to use an, a, a, an example here. Um, I'm not going to break any of you. Aww. Aww. Wow. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, you might have seen this example before. Uh, maybe, how many, raise your hand if you've uh, done confirmation, if you've had your confirmation. Okay, raise your hand if you've not had your confirmation yet. Okay, cool. A little mixed crowd here. So, all right, example here. This is a great example for confirmation, but I'm going to mix it up a little at the end. You'll see. Okay. So, here is our soul. That's a, that's a lot of milk. Here's our soul. Okay. And then we receive. Oh, I hate these. All right. So, then at baptism... Okay? We're giving sanctifying grace. We're giving these graces at baptism. Okay, And they enter into our soul. So, now let me ask you, if I were just like, if I were to just pour this right now, out like, if you wanted a cup, if I were to pour this right now, like, would that be chocolate milk? Right, because it's, it's all white at the top, right? It's just kind of sitting there. So that's our souls at baptism. We're, we're kind of given these, these graces, right, that are given to us. And, um, and they're sitting there, they're, they're active, but they're not fully active, right? And so then enters, like, confirmation. This is the spoon of confirmation, okay? Then enters confirmation. And it quite literally does not add graces to our soul. The graces are already fully and completely there. But it stirs them and changes the reality of within our soul. So then, this is... <laughs> always, there's always that. Guys, you're missing the point. This is confirmation. I'm not going to drink my soul. Actually, no, that's, not, that's getting into where I want to go with this. Okay, no, so... We have this activated potential within us of the Holy Spirit stirring within us. And I think, you know, most of our church, like, you know, most people sitting in the, in the pews have, have received their confirmation. And they have this great potential there. But I would argue, like, I walk into, you know, we walk into most parishes and it doesn't seem like the Holy Spirit's really alive and moving like you would have imagined the early days of the church. And it's, be, 
And it's because there's, there's this missing element where it's great that this happened right here, the chocolate milk example. You know, it's cool. Like, the, there's the milk, and that's the soul, and then there's the, the graces, and then confirmation stirs it. But from a purely material standpoint, what's the use of this right now if I don't drink it? Right? Right? I don't actually want to try it now. <laughs> yeah, I have it in the fridge in my hotel, so it's cold. So that's, I would say that's the part we're missing as a church. And maybe you received your confirmation. But I would argue there might be barriers. Like, trust me, there, it is there that the wholeness of the Holy Spirit, the graces, there is no getting more full. There is no getting more full. But it doesn't mean that this is actually taking action in our life because we might have things that we're just not like inviting the Holy Spirit. Like, think of that. Because words matter. Like, yes, maybe you went up to confirmation and received the sacrament, but maybe you're at a different place now. Our words matter. Like, imagine going to a wedding and like the bride and groom are up there and it gets to the, the most important part, the vows, right? Imagine if like the groom or the bride, they're like, all right, you know, these are what you say I do. And then they're like, no, like, I really, like, I want to get married. I fully, I just, I, I don't really want to say that right now. Like, we would all be like, uh, you know, like, no, you say it. And that's because words matter. Words matter to God, too. That the Holy Spirit, like, he's ready. He's willing. He's, he's waiting there, especially if you receive confirmation or when you receive confirmation. But we got to be open to the reality that there might be barriers in our life that are keeping him from being fully active. He's there. He's waiting. So Pentecost happens in Acts 2. This is, this is really cool. I like it. Pentecost happens in Acts 2. And the, the equation I already went over, the, the equation that happens in Pentecost is this. Is that they gather together. They pray for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit comes. The room shakes. And then they go out and evangelize, right? If you were to go read Acts 2, that's what happens. Now listen to this. And that's, that, is like, that is the first confirmation right there. That's confirmation, okay? Now, if you were to open your scriptures, well, you, you don't have it all here for you, but <laughs> kids want to, to Acts 4, two chapters later. Now, I don't know how much of a time period that is. I don't know whether that's like two weeks later. I don't know whether that's two years later. But get this, Acts 4, verse 31. Then, when they had prayed... The place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That sounds really familiar. That sounds like just two chapters earlier, Pentecost. Like, wait, so is this like a, a second Pentecost? Like, well, what's going on here? Like, we only can receive confirmation once, right? Indelible mark. Yeah, here we are in Acts 4, and we have the same thing happen. And here's why. Our God is a God of free refills. You know, like, <laughs> it's like McDonald's. You know, and then, like, then sometimes we got, like, holes in our cups, you know? And it's like, these things seep out, not the grace is seeping out, but the action of him in our lives. And he, God knows that. And so there's, just like, we don't, like, go to Mass once and, like, well, done. You know, like, like, the Holy Spirit can keep entering into our lives in a more and more powerful way, more and more powerful way if we ask him, if we invite him. We have a God of free refills. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so that's where, like, there's the reaching out of, like, yes, it's great you've been confirmed. But there's the Holy Spirit wants to be more in your life, wants to have a personal relationship with you, wants to be active in your life, and is waiting to do miracles in your life, is waiting to set you free from your fears from your sins, from everything we have, the walls we have in front of it, and he wants to tear that down. So we need to pray for this Acts 4. We need to pray for like a re-stirring of the Holy Spirit. Not, it's the same grace, but it's like, Lord, I, I feel empty. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That we can pray that every day, guys. We can start our day every day like, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me, make me new, make me bold. Send me out today. Let me not be alone. Let me create community. Let me be alive in my prayer life. And we can be refilled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, let, and then just drink that chocolate milk. You know, like, <laughs> that, that, that God is waiting for that. 
And sometimes we can help fill each other. So, St. Paul, he's riding on his horse. All of a sudden, his light comes, he gets knocked down, right? And then he can't see, he's blind. And then God speaks to him. And he's like, what? You know, like, I can't believe you're real. And so, this is a horrible paraphrase. You know, and then, 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 then St. Paul goes to a town. You know, I don't know the name of the town. And, he, and he's, he's, God told him to go to that town and wait. And so he's just waiting, blind, waiting for days. Can't go find his own food, he's blind. And then God speaks to a man named Ananias. I don't know who Ananias is. I don't think he appears in the rest of scripture. I don't know. Maybe if he does, he's... Very small role, like Ananias mowed his lawn or something like that. You know, like, and so like Ananias and, and it says, Ananias, I want you to go into this town and I want you to find Paul. And that's like, Ananias is like, you want, it's not that Paul, right? You know, like the Paul that like kills Christians for a living, you know? And he's like, yeah, it's that Paul. And I was like, uh, <laughs> awkward moment. So, uh, Jesus, uh, I think if you Wikipedia right now, Paul, you might be surprised, okay? Um, you know, like, and he's like, yeah, go to him, lay hands on him, and pray for him. So Ananias, a good servant of the Lord, goes, finds Paul, somehow, who's blind. And Ananias quite literally lays his hand on him and prays for him to be filled with the Lord, prays for him to be healed, prays for him to let the walls come down. And literally, the scripture says, like scales <laughs> fell from the eyes of St. Paul. And his eyes were opened. And he wasn't in fear anymore. He wasn't in isolation, that loneliness of being blind. <coughs> that was because of the body of Christ. That was because of Ananias going and praying over him. That we are able to be that to each other. That the Holy Spirit often works through something like that. So we're going to do something that I know is going to push you out of your comfort zone for a lot of you. Is we're going to do that right now. We're going we're gonna to pray for a re-stirring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Our God who's a God of refills. Our God, the Holy Spirit wants to fill us, that wants to conquer our fears, that wants to be more present to the reality of our lives. That wants to make this weekend not a monument but a movement. We're going to pray for that right now. We're going to be Ananias to each other and lay hands on each other's shoulders and pray that we be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's how this is going to work. You're going to get in groups of three. Groups of three. Is three the same number as six? Yeah. Yeah. Three is three. Okay? Listen up. Don't go crazy. Hold on. You're going to get in groups of three. That means maybe turning to people next to you or finding some other people. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to pray over one person at a time. This is not a, we all put our arms around each other and we pray one giant prayer. No. This is... One person's going to pray over first. Let's say Jamie's first. You guys lay your hands on my shoulders. There's going to be one person that's going to start the prayer. But you can chime in at any time and say, we're praying specifically for one thing. That the Holy Spirit come into him. That the Holy Spirit refill him. That if there's any walls, any blockades to the Holy Spirit being active and moving in their life, that those being removed and the Holy Spirit comes in power. That's what we're praying for. Okay? And yes, you can receive the Holy Spirit like in this way before, like, the sacramental grace is a confirmation. The Holy Spirit can be active in your life before that moment. Okay? Before that, before Pente Pentecost, Jesus breathed on the apostles the Holy Spirit, right? Okay? That was before Pentecost happened. So, so pray for the Holy Spirit to fill them. This is not a new sacrament. This is not confirmation at all. This is actually, this is praying that the, that the grace we have in confirmation or will have in confirmation are be stirred and come alive in us. Okay? So groups of three praying of each other. And you're just praying for like two minutes. If you don't know what to say, say over and over, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Quite literally, like not just in your head. Like under your breath, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Fill Jamie, fill him. Let any walls, just simple prayers like that. And everyone can be praying at the same time. This is a communal prayer, not just a personal prayer. You're going to lay hands on each other. You're going to pray for that. And after like two or three minutes, one of the people in your group is going to kind of be the leader. Ends in a formal prayer. A Hail Mary. Lord be and our Father. That way everyone knows, oh, this is the prayer ending. So it's not like, oh, what are we doing now? You know, it's, no. So this is not a time that I, I want this to kind of be prayerful. Okay, I'm not kind of, I want this to be prayerful. Okay, so laying hands on each other, praying for the Holy Spirit to come. This is not a time to counsel or give advice. We're praying. 
But the Holy Spirit fills our brother, fills our sister. If you have an intention coming into this, if you're like, there's something like on your heart, like, man, I'm just so scared. Or, man, I feel like I'm alone. Before you get prayed over, say that. Say, I would like prayers that the Lord brings people into my life that I can go on mission with, that I can move with. Okay? Any questions before we go into this? This is not the end of the talk. This is the <coughs> action, most important moment of the talk. Yes? No. One person, spend two or three minutes on one person, end it in prayer, then the next person. Good question. Any other questions? All right. Not a huge noise. Just get into your group of three. Start praying.
back together here. One of the most power work, powerful words you can say in the Christian life is come Holy Spirit. Is come Holy Spirit. On a daily basis, I encourage you guys, when you start your morning, say come Holy Spirit. When you reach to a spot in, 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 uh, in school that's kind of tough or someone's getting bullied and you, you maybe want to say something, just say come if you had a friend who comes to you about something tough that they share with you, just before you speak, say, come Holy Spirit. That, like, to pray, come Holy Spirit, on a day before you play in, a, you know, a, a basketball game, just like before, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, fill me. And I think it's one of the most powerful prayers that we can say, inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives on a daily basis, and letting him into the reality of every single minute of every single day. So, <clears throat> after Pentecost... So if you go a little bit before Pentecost 4, after Pentecost, Acts 2.42 says this. Then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Talking about making this a movement, not just a monument, we have the model right here. So first, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and became fearless and lived on a daily basis with the Holy Spirit. But then they got they didn't just leave it that. They became very practical. And it says, Acts 2, 32, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So I want to use that same model. The apostles' teaching and to fellowship, we need community. To the breaking of bread, we need the sacraments. And to prayer, we need prayer. Okay? So, prayer. <clears throat> I'm not going to jump into this, like, because it was like, we've been talking about prayer a lot. You know, uh, Margaret gave a great testimony about it. Uh, my, my workshop was on prayer. We had breakout workshops on prayer. You know, refer back to those. If you want to learn what it is to have a prayer life, how to have a prayer life, where do I even begin? But what I want you to do, what I do want to talk about prayer, is sometimes we just need to make a commitment to it. So I want to challenge you right now. If you are serious about making this a movement, if you are serious about making this not just like, uh, you know, like I experienced God on like, you know, CYC and Legendary Lodge and... But as far as a daily basis, it's not really a, a big part of my life. God wants to bring fullness and freedom into your daily life, and that starts with prayer. So you need to commit to it. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you, have a, uh, if you have a phone or a notebook, I want you to pull that out right now. Bring it to the notepad. Or if it's a notepad, just let it be a notepad. You don't need to press the button. I want you to set a simple and consistent routine for prayer. So, my first question, when? Write it on there. Just write when, question mark, because it's a question. Now, don't answer it yet. You need to pick a time to pray every day. Let's look at, like, Monday through Friday. What is your daily routine? First of all, well, actually, know yourself. Are you a morning person or an uh, evening person? Answer that in your head right now. Okay, you're a morning or evening person. Okay, if you're a morning person, when do you have time to be able to pray in the morning? When? And I want you to try to find, if you don't have any prayer life going on, five minutes. That's your starting point. Five minutes every day. So when? If you're an evening person, when in your normal routine at night can you pray for five minutes? Or if you already pray for five minutes, ten minutes. When? Now answer it. When are you going to pray? Be specific. Not like 8.55 specific, but like after I eat breakfast, before I get in the car. Before I eat breakfast, after
after I take my shower. You know, whatever it is. Write that down. Now write down how long, question mark, which I just talked about. If you don't have a daily prayer life going on right now, do not say an hour. Do not say 30 minutes. My encouragement to you is five or 10 minutes. If you, have not, if you do not have a daily prayer life right now, if you have a daily prayer life, like you're praying, taking time with the Lord every day for like five minutes, make it 10. If it's 10, make it 15. How long? Write it down. What's your time going to be? Next question, and the last question. How are you going to be held accountable? So maybe write accountability, question mark. Two things with this. I want you to name someone. Name a, write down a person who's here and who can keep you accountable to it. Keep you, who can keep you accountable to what you just said you want to do, that you want to pray for five minutes every morning. Write their name down on that notepad. And now, this is a little bit of a homework, after we dismiss you today, go talk to them before you leave and say, hey, can you keep me accountable to this? I want to pray for five minutes, and I'm going to pray uh, after I get dressed every morning before I eat breakfast. <coughs> Tell them that and say, can you keep me accountable to that? Hopefully they'll say yes. If not, find a better human. Okay, so uh, another form of accountability is practicality. This one is the one I think we forget about a lot. There's like some statistic, like you have to do something for 30 days straight and then it becomes a habit, right? I want this to become a habit and I want you to be painfully practical. Let me give you some examples. Because just doing what we just did now, I do not think will create this as a habit. Let's say you said, all right, I'm going to pray every morning before I go to school. Here's what I want you to do. Here's some examples of what I think you should be painfully practical. Get some duct tape. Right? Pray on it. Put it on your deodorant. And promise yourself you will not put on your deodorant until you've prayed every morning. Dang. Put it on your toothbrush. And say, I will not brush my teeth until I've prayed every morning. That way when you go to get ready and you see the deodorant, you're like, oh, snap, I haven't prayed yet. Put it down. Go pray. Then come back to the deodorant to do everyone a favor. Okay, so. If you said nighttime. When you wake up in the morning, grab your pillow, throw it in the closet. Then, when you go to bed at night, if you're, you know, getting in your bed and all of a sudden, where's my pillow? It's in the closet. I haven't prayed yet. Sit down and pray. Grab your pillow from the closet. You can be creative. Do what works for you, but find a way for it to be painfully practical so that it becomes a habit. Think about it right now. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to make prayer a habit? Don't just say, just do it. That's a recipe for failure. Because we're human. Accountability, people, and things we do in our life that just remind us. Why do you think we have Catholic art everywhere? Okay? Crucifix is everywhere. These are reminders. So that it becomes a part of our routine, our daily life. So how can you keep yourself accountable? How can you, and then you're setting up a system of when, how long, who's going to keep me accountable so that we can make this a habit. And you will see, I promise you, you will see prayer change your life. Prayer will change your life. Right, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of, uh, someone who's very really Catholic is a good starting point for someone to keep you accountable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So next up, so off prayer, Community. I talked about community a ton. I'm not going to go into it if you want to refer back to the workshop, but I think you guys know we can't do this alone. Fight for community. Create community at your parishes, at your youth groups. You cannot do this alone. So what the apostles did. It's what we need to do. Prayer, community, sacraments. <laughs> the sacraments are God's way of fleshly coming into our fleshly selves, you know, that, that we can physically have them be a part of our lives. And I would especially say two sacraments that, that we're able to repeat regularly is Eucharist and the Mass and also kind of byproduct adoration and reconciliation. St. John Paul II went to confession every day. I'm pretty sure he's holier than us. <laughs> That's because he saw it as a gift. I don't think we look at reconciliation the right way. It's a gift. No one here is like getting mad at showers. You know, I'd be like, how dare you? 
<laughs> we see it as a, it's a good thing. So is reconciliation. And the Eucharist, guys, we have Jesus' body and blood, and we're able to receive him, we're able to adore him. Do not, do not forget how powerful that can be, having Jesus into your very bloodstream. <laughs> Talk about having God be your life source. He literally enters into your very being, your very DNA, your very skin cells, your very blood. It's kind of creepy, but it's kind of cool, okay? So, prayer, community, sacraments. Here's my last thing I want to leave you guys with this weekend. I mentioned to you guys my favorite scripture passage, John 10.10, 10, where Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. full. I want to ask you guys, who here wants life to the full? Raise your hand. Okay. Now I want to ask you a question. How, how do you measure when something is full? How do you know when something is full? Let me ask you. So, I was thinking about this the other day. Fullness is a hard thing to measure. Fullness is hard to measure. Like, when is something actually full? So, there? It's full? No. So, full? No. Like, if you went to, like, a, a restaurant, like, would you say, oh, yeah, my glass is full? Yeah. yeah. No, but is it is it actually full? Isn't it like, is it like over the top? Okay. Is it full? Look, it is literally, look at it from my angle. Right? It is over the top. Is that full? No. Why not? How do I know when it's full? When there's a little bubble. When it stays on top. When it stays on top, that's when it's full. So what if you said, what if we got to that point there? Is it full? Almost. So how do you, how do you? How do you, wait, so then tell me, how do we know it was full? How did we know? No, tell me, how did we know it? What did I say that louder? When it's overflowing, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maddie.
So going forward from here, find a way to constantly be filled and find your avenue at your home to be overflowing. When you're doing both those, fill and overflow, fill and mission, then you'll be living out God's call of life to the full. And guys, as a church, I heard Father say this, we need you. You are not just the church of the future. You are the church. And we need you. We beg. We, we need you so bad. Your life, your vigor, your holiness, your doubt, your questions, your fear. We need it in the church. We need you to bring it to the table and transform this church and ignite a church that needs igniting so bad right now. And it's going to come from you. It's going to come from you. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, I thank you that you have ignited us, that you are sending us forward to let this be a movement and not just a monument. Lord, that you have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to set us on fire and that we can daily and personally know the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit be active in our lives, in our schools, in our homes, in our parishes. Help us to find a way to be filled. Help us to go forward from here without fear, sent out of here like the apostles at Pentecost, and to go forth. Lord, let us overflow from this place. Set the world on fire, set the church on fire, and be the, be the, the fresh air that our church needs so bad right now. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us. Conquer our fears, conquer our walls. Let us be set free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A couple of practical resources that I want to like give out to you guys. Not give out, but mention you guys. If you really want to grow in prayer, I recommend you a book. It's by an author named Jim Beckman. If you want to write this down, you can. And it's called God Help Me How to Grow in Prayer. It is written specifically for young adults and teens, and it is an incredible book that teaches you how to pray. If you want to grow in relationship with the Holy Spirit, I recommend you, there's this online series of these awesome videos. It's called the Wild Goose Series. The Wild Goose Series. It's free. And these videos, super well done. And they teach you about what it is to live a life in the Holy Spirit. Those are two of my recommendations for that. Um, also, I know we, uh, as far as Paradigm, I know we've sold out uh, quite a bit of stuff by now. If you want any of the stuff that you, then we, it's all gone. Uh, if you use the, the promo code CYC19, I set up a 20% off thing on the website already, so you can use that. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> I just made this up, but we're having a end of the conference sale called Don't Make Me Take It Back to California sale. Okay, and buy one, get one 50% off of all that stuff so I don't have to take it back. Oh, hey, there's my website. Um, anyways, yeah, CYC19, you can get the discount and then we're doing buy one, get one 50% off. Uh, also, uh, if you want to follow Paradigm on Instagram, it's Paradigm Clothing. It's hard to remember, Paradigm Clothing. Um, and then also I'm on there. I'm not that excited to bring the pictures of my kids uh, I, and that's about it, but my kids are pretty awesome, so I guess that's pretty cool. Um, but really, it has been a pleasure to be here with you. It has been my blessing, and I'll be praying for you guys this week. And thank you for the way you've impacted me and the way you say yes to the Lord and the way you said this, this weekend. And I love you all, and it's been awesome. So, God bless. This is kind of wrapping it up. We're getting close to the end here. Um, I just want to thank you guys um, for this awesome weekend. Um, can you guys give yourself a round of applause? I don't know. If that's right. um, but truly, it is. It's really inspiring to to be a college student and to come in, and it's like you know, like we were asked to MC this this convention, and we come in, and what I find is that I'm. My cup is so filled by you guys and your testimonies and the conversations that we have because you guys are so passionate about your faith. Um, I think the theme of Ignite is, is such a, a fitting theme for you guys because um, I found that you guys have filled my cup in that way that I feel ignited. Um, and I hope you guys do too. And so don't take that for granted. Um, you guys, you know, like Jamie said, you guys are the church. People say like, you guys are the church of the future. Like, no, you guys are the church. And so like, don't forget that bit. You have this special energy and this special um, thing that you can share with people to ignite their hearts. And so 
just be bold in that. And uh, just a final like thank you. You guys are all awesome, and I love you all. So y'all are amazing. Thank you for a wonderful and amazing weekend. So to wrap up this weekend, we have uh, an incredible guy who has been, none of this would happen without him or his awesome expertise. Uh, a good friend of mine, and uh, it's been a blessing to know him. So Kevin Mullen, would you like to come? Give him a hand. Sincerely, thank you for our MCs this year. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah. yeah. All right, great. Excited to get home, and who's going on spring break tomorrow? Okay, so I have a, a couple of announcements here, uh, and I'm going to ask Cody to run a couple slides for me. But youth ministers, if you haven't done so already, you, you might be too late to get into the drawing, but we're going to have Julie come up. Uh, Julie is with Stewardship Services for the Diocese in Helena, which is also a financial arm that makes things like CYC Convention 
junior high rally, CYC4, Justice Outreach Project, the things that we do in our diocese come from the incredible gifts and donations in stewardship services. So, um, Julie, for youth ministers, we asked you to stop by and pick up your Sunlight Raffle tickets. Who's been to Sunlight before? Raise your hands. Who's been to Sunlight? Okay, Sunlight is an incredible evening that we do every fall. And uh, it's a fundraiser to help us support Legendary Lodge and youth ministry events in our diocese. Um, one of the things that we want you to know, who saw the red truck outside this at Windy? Who wants that truck? Yeah? Right. Okay. So buy a raffle ticket. But here's the deal. We need your help to sell those raffle tickets. And here's one of the incredible things is that when your parish sells raffle tickets, money goes back to your parish directly. So for every ticket you sell, your parish gets money back to provide scholarships for you to attend things like this, like Legendary Lodge, uh, the Junior High Rally, all of those events. So the more that you help your parish sell tickets, the more that's going to contribute not only to what we do as a diocese, but also in your youth ministry events. So what we ask youth ministers, uh, pick up your packets and then we put your name in for a drawing. And we're going to draw for this incredible gift basket, which I believe also includes two free sunlight tickets. Yeah. Is that right? Two free sunlight tickets. So um, let's get a, a, Jacob, can you be your volunteer up here? And you're going to draw a name for us. So let's do a, a round of applause, a drum roll. <laughs> And the winner is Christina Larson. Come on down, Christina. Give it up for Christina. Incredible youth minister from you. She also has tickets out there. So, youth ministers, if you've not picked up your packets yet, please do so before you leave today. It helps save us on postage. Okay. So a couple of other announcements, and Cody, I'm going to keep you on your toes here and help me out. Legendary Lodge, if you put up that slide, if you have not registered yet, uh, these are our two weeks for high school students. Leadership Camp, what I'll say about Leadership Camp, if you are, if you are interested in evangelization, growing in a Christian leader, if you specifically are looking to help coordinate and plan youth ministry events in our diocese, I highly, highly encourage you to go to leadership camp. I'm only going to say this once, but pay attention. Leadership camp, it is not a prerequisite to participate in CYC board. However, it is strongly encouraged. Okay, so if you want to be on CYC board, you do not have to go to leadership camp, but it's really important that you do. So it's not a requirement, but it's highly encouraged. Okay. Um, at Leadership Camp is where we will discern our four CYC board officers. So if you're not present for that, you're not going to be discerned as CYC board officers. So that is important. But I want to invite anyone to come to Leadership Camp. Uh, but also, it's not, it's not um, uh, if you go to Leadership Camp, you're not signing up to be on CYC board. So it's okay to come to Leadership Camp without going on CYC board. It's also a good opportunity, if you have no idea what I'm talking about with CYC board, it's a good opportunity to come and learn about it. Um, but that's Leadership Camp, it's the first camp of the year. And then our high school camp is July 21st through the 22nd. We invite anyone to, that's what I said. Yeah, read the sign, uh, it'll be online. Uh, also, we invite anyone uh, not from our diocese to participate uh, and to come to one of our camps. So if you're not from the Diocese of Helena, you are certainly still welcome at, at uh, Legendary Lodge. Okay, the next slide. Uh, yep, go to adoration, but that one's over. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, evaluation survey. I want you all to do this right now. Take a photo of this. I'm going to send this out in a text message. This weekend, uh, we need your feedback, okay? We are constantly trying to adapt and learn and develop how, how we can better serve you, how we can make this weekend better serve the needs of the youth in our diocese. Um, but the only way for us to do that is if you share your experiences with us. So take this survey. Um, there's three pages. One is just some questions on how was your overall experience. One page is like, specifically, what was this one like? And the last one is just kind of some demographic information, where you're from, and all that sort of stuff. Take a few minutes. Um, if you can do that right now, that'd be great. 
but if you're not going to remember, but also really take some time. Uh, so if you just need to process and you want to kind of think about it, um, do that. You're also welcome just to send me emails. I'm happy to, to read that. But doing the survey kind of keeps it all in one place, so please fill that out. Um, next one, I want uh, what else did I have? Justice Outreach Project. And Cody's going to pull up a, uh, a YouTube video. Who's been to J.O.P.? Okay, good. This is the best youth ministry event we do. I, more conversions happen here than any other experience. Um, it's incredible, um, but I'm gonna stop talking and just like let the video do it, and we kind of have to do some working around the, the audio, but uh, here we go. This is also available on YouTube. It's muted on the computer. Round of applause for Cody Tredick and Jim Tucker for all of their work this weekend. When you say this really happened, this really would have happened. Yeah. 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 Come, Holy Spirit. Doesn't that photo look fake? I, I, it's not photoshopped. So when Kyle Tannehill was there, it was so funny. I saw that photo and I was like, did we photoshop that? No, that's real. Okay, check out the YouTube video. It's an incredible experience. It's a, a week-long cultural immersion trip uh, on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation centered around Browning, Montana with our Blackfeet brothers and sisters in Christ. It is an incredible weekend. And one of the real blessings this year is we're gonna end with Sunday Mass on the Feast of St. Kateri, which is huge in the Native American world. Um, it's it's gonna be it's it's gonna be awesome. If you're if you're gonna give up or if you're looking for a camp to do this year, this is it. Come to Justice Outreach Project. Okay, what were my other announcements over there? Say yes to adventure, another incredible experience, St. Kateri Week. Check it out. It's uh, it's short, it's you spent two and a half days here on Carroll College learning about creation and Catholic social teaching and a variety of things, and then you actually get to go out to Yellowstone National Park and and put into practice what you've been learning. So it's, it's an, who's been to St. Kateri Institute? Raise your hand. Okay, it's an awesome time. Check it out. I highly recommend it. And what were my other signs up there? Uh, remember these? Yeah, I know that sounds like years ago, but it was actually only like 48 hours ago. But our All Saints Parade, y'all made those incredible banners. They are upstairs, so before you leave, if you would make sure to grab that banner, please. And Liz has something to say. We have a lot of them found. If you want things, we found it. please be reunited with them. They're going to be at the registration desk upstairs. So if you want something, go check that out. There you go. I, seriously, take your stuff. I cannot tell you how many, like, $100 sweatshirts and fleece jackets and laptops and sleeping bags that I pick up after every event. Take your stuff with you and I'm not mailing it to you. Okay, so you gotta drive to Helena to pick it up. Okay, uh, I don't really wanna open it up to questions because we've got a couple other things to do, but if you have questions, you come and find me or youth ministers. Okay, uh, we want to invite our seniors up. Seniors, if you would please come up to the stage. And Father Kirby is gonna lead us in a blessing. Uh, it's always, if you just kind of gather right here. Um, it is always bittersweet at our convention because of this moment. We know that this is the last time for our seniors that you'll participate in this as a participant. But we encourage you to come back, work with, stay connected to your parish. We always need help. So I'm going to invite Father Kirby up and we're going to say a blessing and then lead us in a closing prayer for convention. Uh, I'm going to go in front of you so that you can pray in front of everyone else. And you guys can pray for yourself. Oh, okay. All right, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we lift up these seniors. We send them forth. 
close to your heart. To your sacred heart, they may be conformed to you in everything. They may desire only your will for their lives, and so know their great mission in this world, a mission that only they can fulfill, and a mission that will grant the world with your love. Lord, we pray for them. Send your Holy Spirit upon them. shine so brightly with your light that everyone who sees them will see you. And so, Lord, as you send them forth, help them to remember these friendships and be bolstered by them, to be strengthened by them, and to never forget the graces that you gave them here, that their mission may bring them back to serve this diocese from where they came. saints for new evangelization. And we pray together as a whole conference for these great seniors as we send them forth and we say together our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to Kevin. Oh man, I totally. I had adoring fans. 